1953 saw the last British production for Disney, as the company was outfitting its Burbank studios to accommodate larger live-action films, the first of which would be 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Peter Ellenshaw, the now accomplished matte artist, was to leave his native England with wife and young son Harrison on the thin hope of finding work at the studio. And as luck would have it, Ellenshaw, to his great surprise, would discover he would work on and contribute to 20,000 leagues under the sea in ways he never expected. In 1953, Alan Shaw was anxious to get to a prosperous America and leave a depressed post-war England behind. He sold his flat, packed up all his worldly goods, and with his family set out for the new Disney studios in Hollywood. But Peter was taking a giant gamble. Bort didn't know that I was coming, so I go to the studio and uh, talk to Fred Leigh. He said, well, there isn't much, there isn't much happening at this time. I'm, I didn't think you'd get here this time. Anyway, Walt wants to see you. Now, Walt had a little chair. He sat very close to the ground for some reason. He, at that stage, was thinking he doesn't want to overlook people like moguls do. So he sat close to the ground. It was rather strange to be talking to a man down to a man. He said, I don't know what you're doing here, Peter. There isn't any work for you. Why did you come? Oh, I thought that you'd find something for me. Well, we aren't going to start 20,000 leagues for five or six months. Oh, God. Oh, OK, well, said we'll find something for you, which he did. Walt Disney had long been fascinated by the Jules Verne classic novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and, as he had done with Snow White, Bambi and Pinocchio, he hoped to make it into an animated feature. But with the financial success of the early British live-action films, and inspired by art director Harper Goff's Nautilus designs, Disney believed that the time had come for his fast-growing California studio to produce a true live-action epic. This is the Walt Disney Studio in Burbank, California. So at a huge cost to the fledgling studio, new workshops and stages sprang up on the Burbank lot. There would be ambitious underwater photography, both on location in the West Indies, in new tank-equipped sound stages, as well as sets for the miniature underwater photography. The production was so large, that Disney had to fill much of 20,000 leagues on other studios' backlots. Now, I'm a new boy. I'm nobody, really nobody. I'm just a mat artist. I arrived from England, and I'd managed to get in the union through Watts pushing it. Now, this special effects unit had started shooting on 20,000 leagues. They, were, they had a big tank down on stage three, and I saw what they were doing. Now, I'm looking at this stuff and thinking, oh, God, they've, they've shone light straight onto the, onto the sub, and it looks like a tin toy. So I'm saying, bitching to John Hench. And he said, well, if you don't like it, why don't you do some sketches showing how you'd do it? I said, well, what good would that do? He said, well, it'll do good if you might not realize, but Walt comes round every evening to see what we've been doing during the day. God, really? So I do about five sketches of the sub the way I thought it should be lit. Two weeks pass, and they've shot all this stuff. He let them do that, and then everybody was told to come and see the, the stuff that they've been shooting on the second unit, the special effects unit. Well, we all sit and watch this stuff that I thought, God, this is not good stuff to me. But I shut up, naturally. I was just sitting in the crowd. Lights come up. Walt said, um, is the special effects man here? Yes, he said, Ralph, this isn't working. And he said, what I'd like you to do is see some sketches that Peter Ellenshaw... God, I thought, it's happened. <laughs> and he um, said, Ralph, this is Peter Ellenshaw. Peter, I want you to work with Ralph from now on, and you, 
responsible for telling him the kind of lighting you think it should be. Ralph Hammerus was a special effects pioneer Disney had brought over from 20th Century Fox to work on the effects for 20,000 leagues. Now Peter had to convince a reluctant Hammerus to begin to photograph the miniatures with more dramatic and somber lighting, often making the shots dark and moody. Things came to a head when Hammerus felt Peter had gone too far. He confronted Ellen Shaw early one morning. This isn't going to work, Peter. He said, I told you, I thought you were cutting down the light too much. Now Technicolor says there's nothing on the film. Oh, God, I thought, <coughs> if it's right, I'm done for. I mean, a whole day's work given over to nothing. Anyway, I put on a brave face and I said, well, I know Technicolor. I've worked with them many years and I'm sure there's something on the film. They haven't even looked at it because it's dark. So we run stuff in the theater and there's this somber blue, wonderful, down, down, wonderful dark blue color. And then the blackness of the ship comes out. The submarine comes out and then the ship goes by and gets hit. And it turned out to be wonderful. The production moved to the large outdoor tank at 20th Century Fox, as Ellen Shaw continued to oversee the effects. Well, I managed, I managed to fool them all, and was working for about three months. I go to Walt, we're walking down, go to a, a meeting of some kind. He and I were walking along, and I said to him, Walt, they're getting on fine over at the tank. It seems to me that I can now get on with my mats. There are a lot of mat paintings to do. He said, and burst into rage. He said, I told you to stay with them. He hadn't told me, only told me once. And he said, don't, you cannot come back. You have to stay until we finish. God, I thought, okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I was crushed. The great, my hero had suddenly got mad at me. When he gets mad at you, Walt gets mad. You crush. So we're in the meeting. We come out of the meeting. I'm still crushed. Walt pats me on the back and he said, Peter, don't take it so seriously now, but you, and he burst into another one of them. <laughs> so I got hit on the head twice. Now I had to go back to the fox tank, nighttime or daytime or any time. I had to paint the mats on large pieces of masonite, huge, eight feet across, out in the, in the sun, hot sun, in, uh, by the fox tank, keeping an eye on Ralph, as though Ralph needed an eye at being kept on, but I had to. Walt Disney continued to personally demonstrate great faith in Peter Ellenshaw, and recognized his value to the film by entrusting a key scene in 20,000 Leagues to Peter's vision comes a time when I have to shoot the quarry scene of the prisoners going loading the nitrate ship and they'd picked a quarry in a place which is a funny name it's a true name Cucamonga an empty quarry just east of Los Angeles becomes the location for a slave camp of brutalized workers toiling in the hot tropical sun with the help of longtime Disney collaborator Ub Iwerks Ellen Shaw places the extras in different parts of the quarry and photographs them multiple times through small holes cut in a mask in front of the camera. And just a handful of people turn into hundreds in a single matte painting. But putting it all together was quite intriguing and quite tricky. To us to be doing that was very daring on my part. I wouldn't dare do it now. I was young then. Anyway, it worked out. But I thought it had been abolished. Nothing is abolished that turns a profit to that hated nation. You'll see better what I mean through this. They're loading a full cargo of death. And when that ship takes it home, the world will die a little more. For the final effect shot in 20,000 Leagues, Peter had to find a way to show the explosion and destruction of the island of Vulcania against a sky backing on a scale large enough to be spectacular and believable. 
So we got a glass, a huge glass, and I paint the top to match the sky, and then we get ready to shoot. Now the sun doesn't come out. It doesn't come out very often at this time of the year in California. So we waited all day, and I said, well, we'll shoot it tomorrow. The, the explosive expert said, you can't leave it in the water. It won't be any good tomorrow. All right, we'll have it a test. We'll have a test, blow it up and uh, got it all fixed the thing went off Poof, great except of course it wasn't in, in the bright sun anyway take it over next morning and run it Walt always came in to see the rushes he was always there to see what we were doing anyway I see him walk by and I with my usual insouciance <laughs> I say Walt um, this is just a test we're seeing Walt this morning well, all right, let's sit down and let's run it. Okay, sir. We run it. It turns out to be perfect. It's the one you see in the film. Without the sun, you didn't have a shadow on the backing. You didn't have anything wrong with it. And there was no wind. So the big billowing cloud comes out like a mushroom cloud. Everything worked. So Walt said, well, if that's a test, I don't see we have to shoot any more. I know, Walt. I said to myself, I know I can see it was good too, but that flash that we saw, we didn't know it was any good. For his efforts of skill and imagination, Peter Ellenshaw shared honor with the other men of the Disney Effects Department when they collectively won the Special Effects Academy Award that year for 20,000 leagues. As the award at that time was given to Walt Disney, he made sure it was kept in a safe place, along with his many other Oscars, his office. 20,000 Leagues at that time was considered, we were a small studio and we were making a film that other people could do so much better and everything. He had made the story work and he made it into a dramatic film that is still remembered as an icon of that period. And I enjoyed working. I was an honor to be on to be with him on that.